So Lisa is joining us today. She writes middle grade fiction and has a not so secret fondness for fantasy with a dark twist. Her debut fantasy, A Comb of Wishes, came out this year and was named an ABA Indie Introduce and an Indie Next Kids title. The book has received starred reviews and is included on 2022 summer reading lists by The Hornbook and the Today Show's Read with Jenna Jr. Lisa's work often reflects her West Indian and Black Southern heritage. She, she is a middle school teacher and lives in Boston, Massachusetts with her two kids, with her children and two bossy cats. So Lisa, over to you. Thank you so much for that, Catherine. And I'm really excited to be here with everybody. Um, NaNoWriMo really is like a huge part of the journey of my book. It was a NaNoWriMo novel. Uh, Come of Wishes said this was my 2013 NaNoWriMo manuscript. Um, and yeah, I made it to publication this year with HarperCollins Cool Tree Book. So I'm really excited. And it's been so fun to be a camp counselor this year. So I'm looking forward to hearing about people and what they're working on and share anything that I can. Uh, I've done NaNoWriMo like the November um, nine times, I believe. I think 2012 was my first one. So the year before I attempted this book um, was my first attempt. And uh, I've won twice. So 2013 and 2015 were my two wins. And then the rest have been just good old tips. <laughs> so I'm I'm curious, Lisa, if you want to like tell us a little bit more about your writing process and your writing routine, since you are an NRIMO writer, like what um, what did that look like for you, especially with this? With yeah, this book that just came out. Um, it, it changes. I think um, you know people will ask for like you know my writing routine, and it's like I think the the best advice is that like, there is no good advice about that. It's like, whatever works for you. And really even that can change like in the the moment, like where you are in like your life and your circumstances. So, you know, I have, uh, I'm a single parent and I have three kids and so, and I work full time. So it's hard to find that time to write mostly for me. Um, you know, I work around my teaching schedule. Um, so like things like weekends, um, my school breaks, summer is like a big time that I can get more done. Um, the first with Comb of Wishes, um, you know, I didn't really have a deadline per se because it was my own, you know, motivating myself. Like first I did NaNoWriMo, I didn't finish the book in one month, but I decided I wanted to keep working on it. And so, um, you know, I did um, some revision workshops the next year. Um, I eventually found um, some mentorship programs that I applied to uh, who uh, had some great people who um, were able to read my manuscript. I joined critique groups. Um, but like all during that process, it's like, again, I just had to kind of fit around what worked in my life. Now that I'm working on um, I'm working on a book too. Um, my publishing uh, deal was a, a two book deal, which is exciting. Um, so I've got a manuscript that was also a NaNoWriMo novel. That was actually my 2015 NaNoWriMo. Um, it's got a little bit more work <laughs> to do on it than, uh, you know, I think the window is just tighter. And so, you know, I'm just trying to figure out what works, but I think, um, you know, some people will say, you know, write every day, or they'll say, you know, write a certain number of words. And I just think, you know, whatever works. Um, Linda Sue Park is a kid lit writer who um, I know, and I've taken some classes from, and what she said works for her right now is doing a version of a Pomodoro. So a Pomodoro is like the 25 minute uh, timer that you set, and then you take five minutes off or 10 minutes off, and then you go back and when uh, I was taking the class with her, she said that even for her, the 25 minutes was too long because she was you know, helping with her grandchildren. And so she started doing 12 minute Pomodoros and that's what actually helped her be able to move forward with her work. And so again, I think every writer has to find what works for them and not feel shame if it's not what somebody else is saying that they do. I love that, that's like, altering altering the methods to work for you because yeah sometimes sometimes 25 minutes does feel like too long I do I do this <laughs> with like 
when I'm trying to make myself work out too, I'm like, oh, I can't do a whole hour class. Let me just do 10 minutes on YouTube or something. Yeah. And she said that was like based on like the, the, the toddlers that she was taking care of, like their, spent, <laughs> <laughs> their span of attention, you know, she couldn't get past that. So she made that work for her. Um, speaking of kids, I'm, I'm also curious about your work as a writer and an educator and how that intersects and kind of how each role informs the other. Like if you take any inspiration from, from the kids you teach or, or vice versa. Yeah, I do. I, I think um, they really are tied together, the journey, because when I decided to do NaNoWriMo, the very first year um, I did it, um, I also decided I had learned about the NaNoWriMo Young Writers Program, which is the K-12 uh, version that teachers can use. And there's a, a whole separate website for it. And there's lots of great materials that teachers can access. So I told my fifth graders, okay, you're going to write a novel in 30 days. And, you know, their eyes like got big. And, but I said, I'm going to write it with you. And so that was kind of the commitment that I made. And it was good accountability um, feature for me that like, I'm going to ask them to do something and then I'm going to do it with them. And we wrote together in the classroom. So 2012 was, you know, a bust <laughs> that, that year didn't work out, but the next year, um, I did I same thing. I, I thought about what I wanted to write about. I came up with a story idea, said, you know, I'm gonna write this with you and um and we did and there's great kind of like kind of a community that formed with the kids. Like, you know, we put there's a chart that um gets shared with teachers um that you can put up in your classroom to kind of track your progress. It goes by percentages. So like I'm ten percent done with my novel or I'm twenty percent and you put stickers on it and so my name was on the chart along with theirs. And so they could say, you know, Mr. Stringfellow, I see that you're still at, you know, 30%. Like, are you, is everything okay? Like, and I'm like, yeah, I'm working and, you know, I've got to catch up a little bit or, you know, I would see them moving along really fast. I'm like, wow, do you need to change your goal? It looks like you're going to get there, you know, way before the end of the month. And, and we would talk about things. So that's been great. And um, over the course of the publishing journey for this book, they kind of had a little bit of a window into like what what how does a book get make it to the shelf and so you know they learned about you know the process of querying agents and um you know how you know the editorial process goes i've shown them my editorial letter that i got from my editor what that happened um you know they've have helped me vote on the name of the book at one point because the title, the cover, the title changed but from, you know, my draft to what was actually published and um, just all sorts of things. And so even the, some of the ideas that I come up with, I kind of take inspiration from them. Um, I have a manuscript idea that is based on, we had a word of the day uh, in the morning and one year my students got really interested in phobias and so they, you know, every word of the day was some kind of phobia and, and that kind of was like, hmm, that sounds like a, a fun thing maybe to, to base a fantasy novel of. So, you know, that might be coming from me down the line just based on some of their kind of fun ideas. So it's been a really great process. And I feel like, you know, they've learned a lot that maybe as a young person that they maybe had, wouldn't have learned um, by having somebody who's actually actively working in the publishing industry right now that they can ask questions to and kind of see how it works. That's so neat. Um, we had we have some teachers and former teachers who are watching. They were saying in the chat that they were they were praising your uh, your teaching style. So, <laughs> um, uh, so I I want to I want to remind people if you have questions for Lisa, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, Susan had one um, and asked. Uh, it, she says you're curious if you're doing any school visits in the coming year because she's a school librarian in the Boston area. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm definitely um, doing virtual visits. Um, I haven't gotten my school schedule yet. So when I get that in the next couple of weeks, I'll be able to kind of, you know, put around. But I, on my website, there's a form that people can reach out to me. And um, I'm definitely trying to do some visits, balancing that with also teaching, <laughs> which is a very, very hard thing to do. But um, yes. So you mentioned a little bit about getting to share kind of what the publishing uh, journey was with your students. Um, and I'm curious if you can share a little bit about that with us as well. And 
particularly if you have any advice for people who might want to go down that route and, and pursue publishing? Like, yeah. What, what is that like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest thing um, is not to try to start um, the, the submitting material to um, professionals too early. Um, I think that's like the biggest thing that we, um, you know, you get excited when you finish your draft in NaNoWriMo or whenever you finish it and um, you're like, it's great. It's perfect. I've, you know, read it over and I've worked on it maybe a little bit and now it's ready to send off and it probably isn't. <laughs> and so I would say to take the time um, because I think the biggest thing is with publishing that um, there's so much competition that you want to show your best work um, and you don't want to um, kind of lose any opportunities or waste any opportunities by sharing something before it's the best that you can make it. Um, so I think that would definitely include finding other people that you can share your work to. Um, and there is a funny, I don't know if any of you uh, are on Twitter, if you follow the um, book Twitter, there's like a big discussion yesterday about um, a novel incubator program that was charging people $22,000 for, um, I'm not quite sure what they were charging people $22,000 for, but it, it was ridiculously expensive, like the cost of an MFA program. And um, you don't need to do any of that kind of stuff. I think most work that you can do is absolutely free. Um, if you find some people who are like, like they write in your genre or in their, maybe at the, at the same, part of their journey or, you know, slightly ahead or slightly behind, but who are interested in giving you feedback, form a critique group. Um, there's plenty of websites where you can take classes that have like a critique portion. That's something that I did, like writers.com. Um, there's a site called Ink Voices that um, offers um, like lots of different programming. One of the things that I did with them was um, they had agent uh, first pages. Um, so like you could sign up for a class um, and then you submit like maybe 10,000 or 15,000 words and the agent gives feedback on it and things like that are that are very low cost that you can do to kind of get your manuscript in the best shape. I mentioned mentorship programs before. So there's like different, um, you know, pitch contests that you can do like on Twitter where they have a, like I did author mentor match and I also did um, a program that isn't around anymore, but it was called um, Writing in the Margins. Um, but again, they matched writers with a either published author or an agent and author who would read your manuscript and give you feedback. And, and then again, you just get it in the best position uh, that you can before you actually submit it out to agents to read. Um, I think the other thing just to be aware is, again, kind of to that idea of like, oh, I'm finally done with this <laughs> manuscript. This is what I tell my students, like revision is like a never ending process. I mean, at some point you have to stop, but um, you have to kind of just realize that your view as the writer, like you're going to see what was in your head and what you've gotten onto the page and how you've crafted it. But like other people will bring other insights to it and you have to be open to listening to that sometimes. And so um, you know, I revised with critique partners and I revised with my mentors and then I, you know, went on submission to agents and I was able to get representation and then I revised with my agent and I asked my students, I said, what do you think the first thing I did when I finally had my book acquired? And they were like, did you revise? I'm like, yes, I revised with an editor. Um, so I think that, and that was something that the agent who offered to me asked me, like, you know, I really love this idea. I really love your writing. You know, are you open to revising it? And, um, you know, obviously I, I was, but, you know, sometimes I think people, um, you know, are not as open. So I think you have to think about like, you know, hearing different ideas and obviously you want it to stay true to your story and the story you wanted to tell, but it does take a lot of work um, and just be persistent and patient, um, you know, and realize that it's, very subjective sometimes. So like you might have to, um, you know, send it to a lot of different people before you find the person who it connects with. Um, but yeah, it's definitely a journey that is worth taking. 
So Heather asked, what made you move this novel to the finish line as opposed to earlier attempts? And like, why was this one special? I think um, one is I had a strong idea. Um, I'm not, I know the, the, the debate always is like, are you a plotter or are you a panster? And I think I'm a little bit of both, the, the planster in between. Um, the the novel that I tried in 2012 was the very first thing that I'd ever tried to write, you know, outside of, um, you know, just for fun. And um, I didn't really have a clear version of vision of where it was going. And I also didn't know a lot about writing craft at that point. I was I just decided I wanted to try to write. Um, the second year, one of the things I realized is that I needed more um, accountability. And so um, I, I, excuse me, I found a writer's boot camp online. There was just a, a writer site where people just reported, kind of like what Camp Manorimo does now too, but like you join a group um, and they had different teams and people kind of like, you know, the teams were com competing over, you know, making it to their goals. But, you know, I was in a small little group of like four other, three other people uh, who were all writing middle grades. We all wrote the same thing. And every day we committed to get on the website and list what our words were for that day. And there wasn't like judgment, but it was like a lot of like cheerleading for each other. Um, and that helped me a lot. I think the year before I didn't have that. And so I've done that, that boot camp a couple times. Um, I think sometimes the years that like I haven't made it um, sometimes just had more to do with like what else was going. Sometimes it had to do with the story. Like I didn't really still have a clear version vision of where it, it, I wanted it to go. Um, and then other times it was just like what was going on in life. And, um, you know, November is a busy time. It's Thanksgiving. It's, um, you know, for teachers, a lot of times it's around when we're doing comments and things like that. So it's hard. Um, so again, I'm just trying to be, you know, forgiving to myself. But um, but for me, I think accountability always helps. And um, at least as much as I can before November, trying to, you know, maybe not plot out everything because that's not just my personal style, but um, having a strong connection with the story and kind of like main ideas or, you know, some, some important scenes that I feel like are in it somewhere um, that give me some grounding help. I love that you mentioned the accountability partners. We, we had another question um, from Sophie. Um, he says, I'm also writing middle grade fiction and was wondering how to balance the complexity so you don't underestimate your readers, but also don't confuse them. And middle I've graders been... are pretty savvy. <laughs> so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it too much. And I also wouldn't worry about it so much in a first draft. I would say like, get it out there, get the story out there, and then you can always revise to make it fit the audience a little bit more after uh, you've gotten the main ideas out. Um, one of the things like the mentors that I had helped me with, again, in this uh, first book, but um, I, as I said, I was lucky enough to be accepted to two different programs. And um, one of the mentors was a middle grade writer and the other was a YA writer. And they both brought different um, expertise or different, just like their own strengths as, as writers. So the one who was a middle grade writer really helped me with voice. Um, when she'd look at it, she'd talk about like, is this something a 12 year old would say, or is this the way that a 12 year old would think of something? Um, she really just like kept zeroing in on like, is this middle grade? Is this the way it, it would, how would this read to like uh, a middle grade reader? Whereas my other mentor um, really helped me more with like character and with pacing and other other elements of the story. So both were really helpful and really important. Um, but again, all of that came in revision. So I think um, not to underestimate the middle grade reader. I think some people think um, writing for younger readers is like easier or um, not as complicated. And I, I don't agree with that. Not like... I think picture book writers are like some of the like the most <laughs> like skilled writers and I have not attempted to write a picture book yet like it's like writing poetry like you have a very small word count and you have to craft it so carefully so I think definitely writing for young people um, you know there are different uh, things that are fit each audience level that you learn as you read in that area and I think um, familiarizing yourself but also not worrying about so much of those things until you have a draft. One more question before we move on to our word sprint. Um, this one's from Clinton. 
Uh, now that you have a published book, do you find it easier to write your second book or does it put more pressure on you? Absolutely more pressure. <laughs> like the imposter syndrome is like horrible. <laughs> I've told my editor that and, you know, she's great and encouraging. Um, but yeah, you, I think, and you have to like, put that out of your head. So that's like what I'm actively trying to do right now is, um, you know, I've been lucky and fortunate to have um, this first book have such great reviews and, um, you know, being uh, accepted. But, you know, I, I, of course, worry that I can <laughs> do it again. And so I try not to worry about that and just try to figure out, you know, how to tell the story the best way and like, how am I getting those things across? But yeah, I think um, you, I hear other writers who debuted uh, talking about those sophomore novels and it's kind of, it's a thing that uh, that second book is really tough because you're, you know, there's now expectation and you're now working under um, the deadlines of the publishing industry in a way that you didn't with your first book. Um, so all of that is just a little bit different to navigate. Um, so Lisa, I think you have a writing prompt for us, is that right? I do. So one of my um, Camp Nano uh, care packages had to do with setting. Um, and I love writing description. Um, and But this one, I just, I pulled this from a website um, because it kind of goes to what something I was trying to say uh, about how the setting also is a way to describe kind of your character's worldview. Um, so this is a kind of a setting. So I'd like you to think about um, maybe a scene in your story um, and maybe look at the setting or think about how you might describe it, but think about it in the point of view uh, of your character. Um, so I'll read this prompt. When describing your setting, consider who's looking at it as well as what they see. Take the point of view character's worldview and personal judgment into consideration. What details would they specifically notice? How would they feel about what they see? What emotions or thoughts might those details trigger? So if you think about two different characters, what one person notices is going to be very different than what another person notices, especially based on their background, maybe how old they are. Um, so that is your writing prompt is to write for five minutes about a setting that um, maybe you've been envisioning, um, but get in the head of the character and think about like what specifically that person might notice. Or if you've done that, maybe try rewriting a little bit of that from the point of view of a different character and what would they see in the same place that might be a little different than the main character. Thank you to everybody for joining today. Um, and thanks especially to Lisa for, for coming and sharing your wisdom and expertise. Um, I am going to put Thank a link you. to Lisa's um, website in the chat. So if you want to check her out, if you want to get her book, um, you should you should totally do that. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you everybody so much for joining. And Lisa, do you have any last words of, of wisdom for us before we depart? Yeah, there was a question in the chat that I was looking at. Um, about like how much time do I normally spend between a first draft and when I start revision. And that actually was going to be my closing tip is to give you, yourself space sometimes. I think um, sometimes we get in our heads so much when we're working on something up close that going right into drafting, right into revision after drafting, you don't give yourself that time away. So when, no, when this month is over, when July is over, give yourself, you know, some time, whatever that is for you, whether it's a week, two weeks, a month even, give yourself some time before you go back to it. And I think you'll find that you can look at it a little bit clearer and with, um, you know, a little bit distance that sometimes is helpful. Um, my students all go from like, we love this story to like, we actually go until January is when we start revising and they're like, oh, like this is awful, it's horrible. And don't listen to that voice either, but definitely give yourself time to, to look at it kind of outside of yourself as the writer and a little bit more like as a reader. So that would be my advice. Yeah, thank you all again. And hopefully I will see you next time.
So good luck with your writing. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you.